Well, good evening, and welcome to uh, the How You Diet presentation. We're real excited that you're joining us this evening, and uh, we have a great presentation lined up for you with Dr. Siobhan jackson McCall, and we can't wait to get to the material that she has for us on curcumin and curcogen. But uh, before we get there, I'd like to just open us up in a word of prayer. So uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this day and for this opportunity to share this information. And while the, the country and the world are in turmoil, turmoil in many ways, we pray that you'll um, keep people safe and heal the ones that are sick, Lord, and and just really let people know that you're there and that you're um, somebody that they can lean on and that supports them. We uh, thank you for the wonderful Easter time that we've just experienced. And though it was a unique one, it was one that was really focused on on you and and uh, the resurrection. It was just a real special time in in a way that um, other Easter's aren't. But we pray that you'll you'll bless our evening and um, help technology to work smoothly, and that uh, the information will be disseminated and people will be helped through the through the message. And we honor you in this presentation, in Jesus, and we pray, Amen. But um, doc, Dr. Siobhan Jackson Michael, sorry, um, is a CNNE board certified graduate from the University of Bridgeport College of Naturopathic Medicine in Connecticut, being honored with the 2008 Clinical Excellency Scholarship and award at graduation gave her the confidence to toggle between the worlds of teaching and practicing. Her practice focused on wellness approaches to chronic disease. Dr. Siobhan has worked diligently to create a healthy, scientifically balanced attitude around the use of natural products. She currently leads a scientific advisory team facilitating world-renowned researchers in in the design, implementation, and practical, practical dissemination of their findings. And it's a real privilege to have you with us uh, this evening, Dr. Siobhan. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, and good evening, everyone. So I um, am very excited to be here um, uh, to talk about one of the ingredients that um, we have been working on through uh, my role as um the Director of Scientific Affairs at uh, Dolphus Biotech. And um, curcumin being an ingredient that I use in practice uh, that, you know, is very commonly used by many different types of practitioners um, and something that has just kind of garnered the awareness of the consumer uh, by large and far. I think probably among all of the uh, natural ingredients that there are, Uh, We know that between 2013 and 2018, turmeric-based products were actually the top sold natural ingredient uh, in the world, um, particularly in the U.S., but in the world over. Um, It has only taken second place to uh, an ingredient that has gotten a little bit more renowned uh, in uh, this last year, which is CBD. Uh, but it still remains uh, a, a, a very prominent ingredient because its effects are so large and so far-reaching. So tonight I want to talk to you all about curcumin. This is a, a, a branded curcumin product. Uh, most of the curcumin products on the market um, are uh, slightly uh, tweaked, if you can say, uh, to really enhance the absorption and the potential that's locked in this molecule. So if we can get started, the turmeric, we know turmeric, which is the uh, source material that curcumin comes from. Uh, It is something that has been used in Indo-Asian cuisine for millennia. So more than 5,000 years, uh, it dates back. And you can see it as a very consistent part of their uh, dietary intake. Uh, I've been to India actually three times now, and um, there is turmeric in almost every dish. Uh, And, you know, when you are not a native there, you at some point want something a little bit bland. And so uh, I find myself by the last day there really wanting even my eggs to have absolutely no spice, you know, just no salt, no pepper, no turmeric, anything. 
uh, but it's it's in the diet in a very uh, comprehensive way. And the uh, intake at a very small level over the course of these multiple meals uh, totals to roughly two to four grams per day of turmeric, the whole spice. Um, and we know that curcumin, which is one of the active, the active that has been the most studied, uh, is a small portion of that. Um, the average person on a daily basis is getting somewhere between 60 and 100 milligrams of that active ingredient. Now, when we talk about the medicinal uses of, of turmeric, they date back uh, roughly 2,500 years. So we have a medical text in Ayurveda that actually talk about using turmeric medicinally. And in the food, you know, the different uh, recipes can involve turmeric in many different ways. But in the uh, medical text, you actually see that the uh, formulation always uh, had turmeric, the whole spice, along with something else. And that something else, we find out thousands of years later, uh, was to enhance the absorption. How they knew about it, I don't know. Uh, but we now know scientifically that some of those uh, additional ingredients, they could have uh, formulated it by the text we see ginger uh, used in combination with turmeric. We know that ginger has some anti-inflammatory uh, effects as well. And so there could be synergism there. Uh, we know that they always tended to use it in a milk or a uh, some kind of oil base, like a coconut oil or a milk base, in order to make these formulations. Uh, they tended to always use black pepper. And black pepper, we know, has an active called bioperine uh, or piperine, bioperine being the brand. Um, and we know that this actually enhances the absorption of curcumin through the intestine so it's available in the bloodstream and so that the body can utilize it, get it to the cells, and that it can interact with the cells. So even in text from thousands of years ago, we always knew that to get medicinal value out of turmeric, you needed to add something else to it. You used the whole turmeric, but you added something else to it uh, to enhance the overall effect and to enhance the bioavailability. So that's really become the foundation for all of the ingredients, all of the different brands of curcumin that you might see out there on the market. Everyone in their own way is trying to enhance bioavailability. Um, we know that the association of turmeric or curcumin as the active ingredient with uh, certain diets have, uh, excuse me, with uh, certain uh, conditions have actually shown that there are very low rates of things like colon cancer, prostate cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and various other conditions in India. Uh, and so, again, this has been the association. Now, the active constituents, we always thought to be curcuminoids, right, and, and kind of in, in singular. Uh, turmeric actually has so many uh, different actives. Uh, there's actually more than 250 uh, different components of the turmeric uh, rhizome. And so curcuminoids are the ones that have issues with bioavailability, but there are essential oils. Uh, there are resins. When I show you guys just this next slide, you'll be able to see that there are a number of different components in turmeric. So you have these curcuminoids, which roughly around 2 to 7% uh, on average. You have essential oils. Uh, essential oils give turmeric its, um, its aroma, right? So that very distinct smell in curry actually comes from the essential oils. The color of turmeric comes from curcuminoids. The fixed oils, fixed oils are things like triglycerides, like the kind of oils you see in other uh, vegetable-based, uh, um, you know, ingredients from, from, or plants, I should say. Uh, those are just like triglycerides, plant-based oils. You also see resins. Now, resins, we have learned, uh, are, are actually the package. You can see here that I have like a, a, a you know, a UPS package, you can say. And that is kind of the vehicle that the essential oils and the curcuminoids are packaged in inside of turmeric. So they tend to come together and they're kind of wrapped up with this bow inside of the resin. We call that an oleoresin. So that roughly makes up about 8 to 10% of turmeric. You have moisture. And then you also have fibers and carbs. Um, those uh, carbs and fibers tend to be in the form of these 
uh, repeating units of glucose, uh, which we call polysaccharides, okay? So kind of looking at those major classes, curcuminoids, essential oils, fixed oils, resins, moisture, fibers, and carbs, what you can actually see is there's a kind of uh, a spectrum. And what we've focused on, a lot of the research has focused on curcuminoids as the active and looking at those curcuminoids in particular, how to enhance the absorption. What we have learned, however, in the last, uh, the original studies on, on curcuminoids came out in, uh, like around 2005, 2006. What we've learned since then is that there's other components inside of turmeric that actually uh, allow for um, synergistic value. So that means that one plus one in this case equals three or five or seven. It doesn't only equal two. So the more of these things that you can have in a product, the more uh, comprehensive your turmeric product might be, your curcumin product might be. So we talked about uh, in the medical text how uh, turmeric was always formulated with something, right? We said that ginger or, or uh, black pepper or coconut oil or some milk base. Uh, so when we look at the production of a curcumin product, we start with the turmeric from this root, and then it generally will go through uh, different levels of extraction. So it'll go through uh, at least two phases of extraction where they just use solvents, like alcohol-based uh, based solvents. Those solvents help to pull out the things that are uh, not water soluble, that, that don't like water. They tend to hang out in alcohol, and then that's how you're able to concentrate those actives. So generally, turmeric will go through these two phases of extraction. In the first phase, you'll get the oleoresin. Remember I talked to you guys about that package, that UPS package that normally is the vehicle that you find curcuminoids and essential oils naturally. That's their native kind of housing. That first phase of extraction will actually separate the oleoresin from the rest of the ingredients, the fiber, the, the triglycerides or, or plant-based oils, and the moisture, the carbohydrates. All of those things will be discarded, okay? So this is how we create a concentrated curcumin product, okay? Um, so most of those things will be discarded. Uh, you can see here in the case of the, the actives that I showed you in the previous slide, the ones with images, this is the case where polysaccharides would go away and the oleoresin would be uh, these three, okay? So if we go to the second phase of extraction, remember most of the products on the market are trying to get a very high concentration of curcuminoids because this is where all of the studies are done, more than 9,000 uh, studies done on the curcuminoids, okay? So the goal is to get this as concentrated as possible. Now, the second phase of extraction is now gonna separate out the oleoresin um, to the three components that exist, the resin, the essential oils, and the curcuminoids, okay? And the curcuminoids, again, emphasizing that we want these to be the active, uh, the other two are discarded, and the uh, curcuminoids essentially are what's kept. I show you maybe, what do I have here? Eight different supplement bottles. I've labeled them A through H, arbitrarily. And what I'm showing you here is that they all use this uh, concentrated curcumin um, as the base of their product. And then some of them have uh, patents or different formulations that they've patented that will use different delivery systems where they will try to enhance the absorption of this thing, curcumin, that's now been concentrated. So some companies have found that when they add back in the essential oils uh, to some degree, along with the curcuminoids, they actually get an enhanced absorption, okay? And you get kind of this synergism. You have one extra active that was normally in the turmeric itself, right? You have this added back in. So you have, you're, you're, you kind of have the benefit of being concentrated, but at the same time, you still have a profile that's bordering on something that's more natural, more native state. Uh, other companies have uh, uh, added back in or added to their formulation black pepper, 
right? And so maybe that's formulation G. Uh, other companies have added in fenugreek uh, as a active uh, to help with absorption. And so maybe that is brand E, right? So there's all these different brands. All of them, however, base their product from having very high concentration of curcuminoids, 95%, and then they add their other thing back in. What is the difference with curcugen? Curcugen is essentially concentrating, they've found a way to concentrate the curcuminoids, but not to 95%, not to a purified form, right, but to a concentrated form, which is roughly 50%. Uh, however, they've been able to keep many of the other actives that are naturally found in the turmeric, okay, which have uh, research has shown have benefit. Okay, so separately from turmeric, we have research that shows that the polysaccharides, uh, excuse me, separate from curcumin, we have research that shows that the polysaccharides are actually beneficial. These are the water-soluble components of uh, turmeric. We have research, as I mentioned before, that shows that the essential oils have benefit uh, with uh, absorption as well as their own clinical benefit. And then we are one of the first companies to show that a form of the resin uh, called polar resins, we'll talk about that, part of that packaging has benefit, okay? And in this case, it has benefit for absorption. So this is to give you guys an overview of how curcumin products are formulated from their original material, which is turmeric, and then how they end up in the different products that you see on the market, okay? And then to differentiate how our product tries to keep uh, the as many of the uh, as many of the uh, components of turmeric in its native state, trying to keep it in uh, the final product. Okay, so that's one of the differentiators, and we'll start to break that down. So if I could put that into words, I would say that the value of curcumin is that it delivers the wholeness of the spice. Right, so it's not giving you turmeric. That's very different. In turmeric, we said that curcuminoids are only roughly 3 to 7%. Uh, uh, the curcumin product does enhance the curcuminoids, the, the most studied active, to 50%, but it doesn't do it to the complete exclusion of other actives, okay? So there are essential oils. There are these polar resins. There are these polysaccharides that are preserved. And then what we uh, are delivering is a turmeric product that is 98.5% based in turmeric. Uh, you'll see that some companies, as they've tried to uh, actually uh, enhance the absorption of their product, that their concentration of turmeric goes down because whatever those other ingredients you can see here in the gray, as you enhance the others, you actually reduce the turmeric, okay, just based off of pure volume, uh, with the goal of improving absorption, okay? So the goal here for all of these different brands is to, is to improve absorption. But the downside is that sometimes in doing that, you actually lose out on what's natural and have a majority of what's non-turmeric or sometimes even synthetic. Uh, and so the end product, it goes under the, the, the vise of being natural, but when you look at the small details, it actually has a lot of uh, ingredients or percentage of ingredients that may not be natural. So I said 98.5% rhizome base. So what's the other 1.5? So the other 1.5% in this product is uh, silicon dioxide, which is a flow agent, and it's pretty much used, if you look at the back of any of your uh, ingredients, um, any of your products. It's almost in every product that's on the market because it simply helps in the manufacturing of capsules. And so uh, because there's essential oils that re are retained in this product, it can be a little bit on the stickier side. So just for the uh, property of uh, enhancing flow, uh, there's a little bit of silicon dioxide in the product, and that makes it the 1.5% uh, that's missing here from 100 you can see, uh, if you compare, there's some other products that show very close to 100. Uh, they show very close to 100, but they are still missing out on other components of turmeric. So they are mostly concentrated with curcumin, 
but they may not have essential oils, they may not have these resins, they may not have the polysaccharides, right? So they, it, it may be very uh, uh, distorted in a way, like leaning very highly on curcuminoids, losing out on some of the other uh, partner ingredients. Okay, so moving forward, we talked about uh, this kind of checklist that curcugin is 98.5% uh, turmeric base and 50% curcuminoid rich, okay? So when we talked about this process of, um, this process of, of concentrating or purifying curcumin to get it to be, you know, as concentrated in the product as possible, the normal process is to get it to 95%. And all the brands start with that as their base, okay? Curcugin is different because we concentrate to 50%, okay? So this is an extraction. Uh, it's actually a co-extraction where they're able to retain some of those resins, um, and they are able to obtain the curcumin product at 50%. Now, there's something special about being at 50% that doesn't happen when you're at 95%. One of the things that happens is if you look at this uh, pie chart that I show you here, there are uh, cousin molecules to curcumin, okay? We, we call them curcuminoids as a family. And I'll talk about this uh, in a couple slides forward, but there are these uh, other curcumin-like uh, molecules. They're very, very, very closely related in their structure. We call them analogs or cousin molecules of curcumin. So you can see here that I have uh, uh, specified them by different colors. So these are the different colors of curcumin. There's uh, uh, curcuminoids. There's orange for curcumin, the main active. There's red for D and C, which is, stands for uh, um, demethoxy curcumin, so it's a cousin, and then it's green for bis demethoxy curcumin, so a long name, but we call it for short, uh, nickname is B, D, and C. Now, these all exist in uh, the curcuminoid. These all exist in the turmeric root, in the turmeric rhizome, and they exist in a specific ratio, okay? So, in general, you'll see curcumin, when you take a if you, if you were to go take the turmeric right out of the ground and you were to analyze it right from the ground, you didn't manipulate it, you didn't do anything to it, you would find out of the 5% of curcumin that's there, when you look at the breakdown of all the cousin curcumin molecules, you'll see that roughly 65% of it is curcumin, the main one, the main guy, right? You'll see about... 17, 19% roughly being DMC, the cousin. And then you'll see another 16 or so percent being BDMC, okay? That is the ratio that you will see if you pulled the turmeric root right out of the ground and analyzed it. We looked at a couple of slides before, and I'm just gonna go back there very quickly, that when you do the first phase of extraction and you separate out, uh, say, three of these six uh, groups, getting the curcuminoids, the oleo resins, and the resin together, and then on the opposite side, getting the fibers, the six oils, the moisture, the carbs, et cetera, together. We said that the rest is discarded normally, and the oleo resin is then acted on by a second phase of extraction. That's the normal thing. The difference is that, uh, is that curcugen, excuse me, the difference here is that curcugen actually uh, works based off of that oleo resin, okay? So just to go back again, when you look at the oleo resin, right, the oleo resin in that first phase of extraction actually mirrors the turmeric that you just took out of the ground, okay? The ratio of those curcuminoids, now they are more concentrated. There's, there's more, it went from, say, 5% to 35% more concentrated because you got rid of those other guys. But when you look at the ratio, the breakdown of those cousins, it still mirrors what you had in nature. Now, curcumin, because we use the oleo resin as the base, okay, we don't go down to the purification and the second level of extraction, 
you actually see that curcujit mirrors very nicely to the oleo resin from which it came and then from the turmeric that you took right out of the ground. Okay, so it's curcuminoid rich, it's not pure, it's curcuminoid rich and it's concentrated to a point where you're still able to keep the natural native state of turmeric, how it looks right out of the ground, okay? Now, the difference is, if you were to take that second level of extraction we talked about, so this is phase one, and then going from oleoresin to 95% purified is phase two. Look what happens with those cousin curcuminoids. They are distorted from nature. You actually get a high concentration of curcumin. It goes as high as like 85%. Your DMC is reduced. It goes down to maybe 7 to 10%. And your BDMC cousin is significantly reduced. And in some of the products that derive from this purified form actually almost lose all of the BDMC. And what we've learned actually is that uh, curcumin, we know that it has all these wonderful benefits, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, uh, you know, it's good for uh, the liver and it's good, it's anti-infective and it, it has properties that are great for mood and for uh, gut health and all of these different things. But what we've learned about some of the cousin molecules is that they have these synergistic benefits that are better in some cases than curcumin. For instance, DMC has greater anti-cancer or anti-cancer uh, preventive, anti-growth, uh, like a, a growth that is, um, uh, you know, that is out of control. It controls the growth of cells so that it, they don't proliferate and turn into cancer. It does a better job at that than curcumin does, and that's the DMC uh, cousin, the red one. And BMDC, BDMC does a better job at crossing the blood-brain barrier and actually attaching itself to uh, uh, beta amyloid plaques, which are the plaques that set the foundation for Alzheimer's. So the idea is that in nature, there was a specific ratio where you got a little bit of all of them that showed benefits in various areas that when you purify, you actually put a, a distortion to that, uh, you know, baseline, and, and therefore you may lose out on some of the potential of some of the other actives, okay? So hopefully uh, that, that's a point there that is um, – it's actually quite unique about this product. I talked about it being polar resin powered. So those resins are almost always discarded. Our product is the only product that actually is able to use uh, some of the resins that are naturally found there. There's two types of resins. They are uh, what we call polar and non-polar essentially, meaning that some of them are water loving and then some of them hate water, right? Non-polar, they tend not to do well with water. Polar does better with water. So the patent uh, process on this uh, product, patent pending process, actually allows them to co-extract the curcuminoids, so extract the curcuminoids at the same time that they extract these polar resins. And these resins have actually shown that when they are paired with curcuminoids, curcuminoids are generally fat-soluble. They do not like to be in water. But when you pair them with these polar resins, it actually helps curcumin hang out in water and do a better job, right? Uh, why is that important? So this shows you like a water molecule. And normally curcumin is uh, hydrophobic. I told you that it doesn't like water. It's more, it's like oil. If you had an oil and water mixture, oil stays at the top, water goes down to the bottom. They don't interact well. Uh, curcumin is more oil-based, so it just doesn't tend to interact with water. But when you put P resins, these P resins kind of like are these like little antennas, if you will. They're, they're like these little, uh, I would call them antennas for lack of a better word, uh, that they, they actually surround the curcumin molecule and they allow them to interface with the water molecule and actually stabilize in a suspension. And so I want to show you guys what this actually looks like um, in a in a
interaction in between. Whereas you can see curcogen with those polar resins, those P resins, it allows it to disperse and kind of uh, stabilize. So it's not water soluble. It's not going to stay like that forever. If you left this on the counter for a few hours, you're going to see that those resins kind of, uh, I'm excuse me, the curcuminoids kind of fall out of the solution. They'll fall out of that uh, fluid. But as soon as you, you quickly shake it again, you'll see that they disperse and they stabilize and they hang out there for a little bit of time again. Okay, so this is what the resins uh, help us to do. So I actually want to stop for a minute, and I want to uh, ask you guys a question or two. You can interact with me for a second. So my first question is, how does having a product that contains multiple synergistic turmeric components sound to you? Um, is this something that sounds interesting, that it, it would have multiple uh, aspects of the natural uh, plant, or is it not really that interesting, or is this something that uh, you guys think is, you know, relevant, but maybe not that relevant? Oh, great. So I have some numbers coming in. So uh, I have uh, right now the uh, audience is saying that for the most part, that they think is interesting. I actually got some more numbers. Some people are saying it doesn't really matter as long as it works. Okay, That's, that sounds good as well. Um, I'm getting more polls coming in that it's interesting. Um, that's actually a little bit higher now. I got more people, around 85% of people saying that it is, uh, it's interesting. They would be interested to learn more about those nutrient, nutrients being as close to food state as possible. All right, very good. So let me just uh, share those results with you guys. Um, I have a second question. Um, this question is, now that you can see what a, a turmeric product can do versus what maybe uh, your, your experience has been, with turmeric products uh, that have been uh, used in capsule form, I want to ask you guys if you've ever taken your turmeric product out of its capsule, like to use in a smoothie or drink. Uh, I know that I used to do that, and I would just kind of like throw it in my smoothie. It had to be a smoothie, though, because I needed to blend it up. Uh, sometimes I like to have my uh, things just all thrown in and take it at once. Um, but using it in like a water or something like that, have you guys ever had that experience? Okay, so I see some of the polls coming in. Um, some people have done that. Uh, others have not, but they're actually interested in using a powder form. Um, some people are saying that they prefer to actually drink their uh, nutrients. Um, some people are also saying, no, I'm pretty cool with uh, the capsule format. I, I don't have a preference. So it's, it's, it's kind of mixed. Um, you know, I, I think on average, some, most people are saying that they are fine with the capsule format. Well, one of the cool things, I'm just going to send these uh, results out to you guys to see where we are uh, at this moment. But one of the things that's really interesting about this product is you have the flexibility to do both, right? So if you wanted to put it in your drink, if you wanted to put it in your water, you could pull it out of the capsule, throw it in your drink, and you could actually see that uh, it, it wouldn't stick to your glass, it wouldn't hang out at the top, it would disperse nicely so that you could get the full, uh, you know, uh, quantity of, of volume that was in the capsule. And if you wanted to keep it in the capsule, well, hey, you could do that too. So there is that flexibility uh, with this brand, which is nice. All right, so moving forward, essential oil hand, in hand. So the essential oil, which I told you kind of give the aroma, it's discarded in most brands, okay? Um, but here it's retained kind of in its food state. Um, it's not removed and then added back in, but it's, it's native to that packaged, uh, the natural packaging, the oleoresin. Um, and we know that the essential oils both help us with uh, bioavailability, but it has their own, it has its own bio uh, efficacy profile. So it's been shown to uh, be very anti-infective. Uh, it has some anti-parasitic uh, uh, activity. Uh, we know that it is uh, uh, strongly uh, affiliated with um, liver health. Um, so the, the essential oils are both 
good for enhancing absorption as well as uh, their own efficacy profile. Now, the polysaccharides, I think this is one that most people are probably just not uh, familiar with at all. Uh, this is definitely discarded in the majority of brands. Um, the polysaccharides are really the water-soluble component of turmeric. So when you're doing these kind of extractions in alcohol, the water-soluble part always goes away. Um, we know that since it's water-soluble, it has no trouble with absorption. So it's, it's bioavailable in and of itself, but it also has some, uh, some efficacy associated with it for actually reducing pain um, in and of itself, separate from curcumin. Um, so we are able to deliver both the curcuminoids, polysaccharides, uh, uh, some content of essential oils, and those pea resins. All right, so the next slide is just talking a little bit about those different cousins, right? So you have curcumin, DMC, BDMC. Um, you also have these metabolites. So you have the transformation of curcumin in the gut. Uh, where you get these uh, products that are uh, slightly transformed, they're, they go through a process we call reduction, and they're, tra they're slightly transformed. Uh, the main one, which is tetrahydrocurcumin, actually, uh, if you guys have uh, heard of white curcumin, um, that is really tetrahydrocurcumin. It's curcumin that has been uh, transformed. Sometimes they transform it in a lab, and then they sell it as white curcumin. Uh, but in the body, there is that natural transformation that happens. And the interesting thing is that it happens in the gut, in the microbiome. So the good bacteria in the gut actually will transform curcumin to this very, very powerful uh, uh, metabolite, uh, which actually has very potent antioxidant effects, even more potent than curcumin itself. And then you have these conjugants. These conjugants are uh, really the uh, form of curcumin that's inactive. It's the part of it that doesn't absorb in an uh, active state and utilized by the body right away, you can think. It's, it's kind of what's called like the storage format or the, the, the potential of curcumin because it relies on, it, it requires a, a specific environment in order to be activated. But these all are very important molecules. And one of the things that we say with curcumin is that we tell the whole bioavailability story, okay? And I have whole kind of in parentheses because it's, it's as comprehensive as we know at the moment. Uh, it could probably, you know, the more we study it, the more we know. But as far as comprehensiveness, it's as comprehensive as we know for the moment. And so in our uh, evaluation of absorption of our product, we not only looked at what's happening with curcumin, but we looked at what's happening with the cousin molecules. We also looked at what's happening with uh, tetrahydrocurcumin, that form that's been bio, uh, transformed by the gut. And we also look at the conjugants because the conjugants tell us a little bit about what's available in this storage form or in this uh, uh, potential form that in the right environment can be activated. Why is all of this talk about bioavailability important? It's important because bioavailability essentially correlates to efficacy. So if something is not absorbed, then oftentimes the effect is not there. So if, uh, unless there's like a local effect, which we know curcumin has a local effect in the GI tract, but to get into the system to have systemic effects, it needs to absorb. So bioavailability often translates uh, to bioefficacy, and so that's why we focus on it, and we want to tell as comprehensive of a story as possible. So I want to walk you guys through uh, just a couple of terms in understanding bioavailability. So remember those little antennas that we have on our curcumin molecules, those P resins? So this is curcumin. okay? So we know that curcumin actually interacts with um, uh, of water or like a fluid uh, membrane. So we know that it's going to actually interact with the cell lining and the digestive tract, which is full of fluid. And it's going to help to get curcumin into the bloodstream, okay? Now, when curcumin gets into the bloodstream, um, it actually, I'm sorry, this is showing, not the bloodstream, this is, yeah, so this is showing the intestinal lining, and then this is showing the bloodstream. When it gets to the bloodstream, a large majority of it is going to go directly to the liver, okay? So in the liver, because curcumin is, uh, is more fat soluble, so without those resins now, okay, that curcumin needs to be attached to a, a car, a vehicle, so that it can move around in the bloodstream, right? So the P resins help it to get to the surface of the intestine. At the intestine, the curcumin will move across, 
once it moves across, it no longer has that ability to interact very well with water. So the body needs to attach it, large majority of it, to a transporter. So I have these transporters here uh, as cars, right? So you can see that it's like a taxi. The curcumin gets in a taxi, and now that taxi can move around the body freely, okay? The problem is, is when it's on the taxi or in the taxi, it's not active. Only when it's free without the taxi is it in the active state. So when you say something is bioavailable or it absorbs well, that means that you get more of it into the body, into the bloodstream than you would if you uh, took it in a different format. That's what something that is bioavailable does. Now, the way that some people talk about bioavailability, they actually talk about what was previously in a taxi but now has been removed uh, from that taxi by using a process that is uh, done outside the body. It's done in the laboratory. They'll actually remove the curcumin from its taxi and they'll claim that that enhances the absorption. Really, the way that you wanna, you wanna qualify something that's, uh, that's absorbable is you want to qualify it based off of how much of it wound up in the bloodstream uh, as is, as is, okay? Not removing it from the taxi and assuming that that's what everyone's body is gonna do because everyone's body is different. You can also see here that once it's in the body, uh, as it goes down the digestive tract, it will be converted into this white curcumin. So this kind of gives a schematic to show you of uh, what happens in the lower intestines, in the colon, where you have your uh, microbiota. All right, so this is just an idea of, of helping you guys understand how this term bioavailability, uh, actually how those numbers can be played with a little bit and why you want to tell the whole story. So with Percogen, we look at both reactions that can give us those different uh, aspects of uh, curcumin, right? Not just the, not just the uh, curcumin itself, but look at the cousins, look at the form of it that's storage or, or kind of the potential form of it, and then look at the form of it uh, that's been activated in the gut. And what we found in our absorption study is that uh, curcugen is 30 time, 39 times more absorbable in its free state, just whatever wound up in the blood in the format that you gave it. It was 52 and a half times more uh, bioavailable as a total. So remember, when you had those cars in the lab, you used the process that you removed those cars. So we did it both ways. We did it the way that uh, some people do it, where they talk about free curcumin. We did it the way that other people do it, where they take it out of, you know, its transport vehicle. And then we looked at that white curcumin. The one I told you is very high in, uh, in antioxidant activity. And we found that it was 31 times more absorbed uh, than taking regular curcumin. So I apologize. So what does this really mean? So this is kind of just showing you a zoomed in version of what we were talking about before. If you look at curcumin and you look at it without the P resins, just a regular curcumin, normally because they don't like water, they all clump together. And so when they clump together, uh, the intestines lining, the, the lining of the intestines is only able to absorb like really what's on the outside of that cluster. So the absorption is very low. This is showing you what actually gets on, on to the other side uh, in the blood. When you have those P resins, remember those polar resins allow it to interact better with water. So they kind of separate, uh, they have an increased what we call surface area. So more of them are separated and able to interact individually. And therefore you get a lot more uh, in the blood, right? So what we say with our product and what this is proven with uh, the bioavailability study is that this product shows way more curcumin in the plasma up to 24 hours. Um, and you actually see two peaks here. And what these two peaks are showing is that uh, the body will process a certain amount of curcumin and then later on, some of that curcumin will be liberated or freed up. Uh, and then there will be a second uh, wave of curcumin that will come through. So you can actually see here up to 12 hours, you really have a significant amount of curcumin in the plasma, 39 times more if you calculated all of the volume underneath this curve. When you stretch it out to 24 hours, you still see that you have, uh, you have levels that are measurable more than what you have with taking regular C95, okay? Now, 
this is kind of looking at this uh, whole BA story where, where you go beyond free curcumin, where you go beyond the one we just talked about. You look at total. Total curcumin is a function of what happens in the liver. I told you in the liver you add a car. We call that conjugation. So we're looking at these two uh, kind of inactive forms of curcumin. So we know that what activates that in a person is having a low pH, which tends to happen when you're inflamed, when you have infection. Uh, we know that it's activated when you have a lot of immune cells hanging around, so in maybe uh, cancerous states or inflammatory conditions. We know that uh, these, uh, this, this inactive form will become active. But in a person who may just be taking curcumin for preventive reasons, they may not need as much of that activated form, or I should say form of uh, storage, because their body is not as inflamed. So the whole idea here is that you want to show really what's available to everyone consistently. When you start showing uh, what's available for some people and not for other people, it can kind of skew the results. So again, we want to tell the whole story so you can see, okay, if I'm someone who has you know, chronic disease or rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis, or I know that I have a lot of inflammation, that my potential is much greater uh, even than what's available and kind of right away. Um, this also looks at those cousin molecules, right, the, the DNC and BDNC, which we said had other benefits. Let me show you guys what this looks like in a video, if you will. Okay. How do I get my... Hmm. This is actually supposed to show as a, uh, an animation. Um, it's not showing up here, but I can kind of just walk you through it. So what this animation would show is it's showing these are areas of kind of hot spots, right? These are, could be potential areas of inflammation uh, on this woman's body here. So we're taking kind of a zoomed in uh, uh, look at the uh, knee area. And you can see in this knee area, again, we're emphasizing inflammation by showing kind of the redness in that area. If we could touch it, it would probably feel warm. So I told you guys that you would have these uh, curcumin molecules hanging around uh, on their vehicles in their taxi cabs because that's how they need to move around the body. And you would have a few of these free molecules of curcumin, okay? You would have a few of these free molecules of curcumin. What would actually happen when you, uh, when you had extensive inflammation uh, in an area you would actually have white blood cells here that would digest this uh, car. It would actually break down the uh, curcumin from its car and it would liberate it. It would make it free, or, or in this case, we will call it total curcumin. That's what we're doing when we take the analysis of total curcumin. So it would actually liberate this and show it uh, as, as, uh, as free. So I just want to have, I just got two more slides to go if you guys are uh, just uh, hanging out with me. So. We also take it one step further. We go beyond free, beyond total, and we evaluate uh, this uh, reduced form of curcumin. Remember, this is the form that is acted on in the colon by the, uh, by the microbiome, uh, by the bacteria in the gut. So the more good bacteria you have, the better they're able to activate uh, curcumin into this uh, potent antioxidant. But the great thing about it is the, uh, even if you have dysbiosis, if you have bad gut, uh, uh, microbiome, you actually, uh, curcumin improves it over time so that you become a better uh, producer of this uh, potent antioxidant. So if, if you're good to start with, you actually will produce a lot of this antioxidant. But if you are, you know, if your microbiome is a little unbalanced, it actually will help to improve the microbiome so that you become a better producer of this antioxidant. Um, and then this was just an animation to kind of show the same idea. Uh, I'm sorry that it's not working properly here, but it's, uh, what it would show is that you would consume the curcumin as orange, right? And it would go all the way through here. This is all the small intestine. And once it got to the large intestine where you have these, uh, these um, uh, bacteria, these probiotics, good bacteria, I'm showing them here just as these little blotches of color. They would take this orange curcumin and then they would metabolize it. They would transform it to a white curcumin, which we call tetrahydrocurcumin. And that tetrahydrocurcumin actually does better with water 
So it easily moves through the body, and it would show up or appear as little white dots all over the body. All right, so that shows you that uh, our product, when you take it in, we actually have been able to evaluate it. When you compare it to regular 95% purified curcumin, you get 31 times the amount of that potent antioxidant, and that you can see that it's extended uh, significantly out over 24 hours. Now, how do you, how does all this come together? So uh, this product now is powering um, the uh, Hallelujah Acres Hallelujah Diet uh, curcumin product. They are branding it as uh, professional strength curcumin. So this is the ingredient that's powering it now. Uh, our clinical dose, so we've done some clinical studies that are just uh, wrapping up. Uh, we've already shown preliminary data in uh, reducing pain in a, uh, an exercise-induced uh, exercise um, inflammation. So it shows a reduction of pain, reduction of inflammatory uh, markers, uh, reduction of, uh, of swelling, and improvement in range of motion uh, in the uh, knee joint. And this is only with 500 milligrams per day, which is a single capsule. Um, we've also looked at a gut study where we're looking at the, the microbiome, looking at the change in the microbiome. Uh, uh, we're waiting for those results to come back in, but we have some results that have already shown improvement uh, in this group of uh, subjects uh, that actually had IBS, where we looked at improvement in, uh, where it showed improvement in uh, bloating and improvement in um, just overall uh, digestive upset and improvement in um, uh, bowel movement, uh, as well as improvement in mood uh, parameters, um, which are oftentimes associated with IBS as well. So we're just waiting to see the details of how uh, this product changes the microbiome, but we're very confident that we will see some positive changes. Uh, both of those studies are actually uh, closing up and they will be published uh, quite soon. So um, Curcogen now powering this formulation is in a once per day 500 milligram dose. Uh, versatile use, you can, for those who like it in the capsule, for those who prefer to take it out and put it in their drink, you have that flexibility. You have a longer retention of curcuminoids. Most of the products on the market are showing retention maybe up to eight hours, right? And then it dips off. Uh, with Kirky Gin, you have retention uh, up to 24 hours, up to 12 hours, it's quite high still. Um, more antioxidant and anti-inflammatory potential. So you're having that THC, that white curcumin plus the regular curcumin. Um, faster in-system availability. So what does that mean? You saw that peak come up. The first peak uh, come up around an hour uh, and then stay up. And then you see a second peak come up uh, uh, around the, uh, the eight-hour mark. So you have these two peaks that are showing uh, kind of a sustained uh, function in the body. Uh, you have the whole rhizome. So you have these other components that are native to turmeric. And then you have this whole food format. So I thank you guys so much for your time, and I will take uh, any questions that anyone has. Well, Dr. Siobhan, thank you so much for the information. It was quite an enlightening and, and a powerful um, product, and it's kind of neat to see how it works um, in the body. So thank you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a, a few questions. Um, sure. Somebody says that they've been using it for about a week, and um, – Today, they were working in the kitchen, and they had a blood vessel break in their middle finger. They used to do have blood vessels break in the, you know, all the time, but they wondered if there was any correlation between the curcumin, or the curcogen, and a blood vessel breaking. Do you have any thoughts on that? Hmm. Not that I'm aware of. I mean, in general, uh, you know, curcogen, or I should say curcumin, um, actually should improve uh, like the integrity of uh, blood vessels. I'm trying to remember. I know there's been some uh, studies that have looked at uh, curcumin, uh, polyphenols in general for uh, improving uh, vascular integrity. So I haven't, um, I don't know that there would be any correlation uh, to this product um, or, or to curcumin in general. I, I, I don't, I cannot say that I would make that connection. We are not aware of any. Uh, actually, we've done uh, some studies on curcogen, 
And we've been able to show that uh, we've done the, some safety studies and we're, we've shown that uh, curcumin is safe um, in very high doses and over extended period of time um, with some of the uh, safety studies that have been done. So I, I don't, there's no correlation that I can actually think of between that and blood vessel break. Okay. Um, somebody else wrote that they've been taking other um, biocurcumin and it made their stomach hurt. And um, they wondered if curcogen would do the same. Apparently, a, a gastro told them that the um, curcumin acts like ibuprofen, and that's what was irritating her stomach. Um, again, I think that curcumin products are always uh, generally suggested to be taken with food. Um, I know that there are some people who are who can be more sensitive to curcumin products in general. Um, my recommendation is it doesn't matter what the brand is to always take it with food because that just reduces uh, some of the effect. You have to remember that it's a spice, and oftentimes spices uh, increase the uh, the digestive juices. They also increase the um, what do you call it the the uh, the movement of the what we call peristalsis, the movement of uh, food down the digestive tract. So. Uh, Curcumin by nature is like a carminative. Uh, when we use it in herbal medicine, we say that it helps with reducing gas and things like that because it really helps the, the digestive tract to move. But one of the other side effects of it is, is that it produces, um, it produces like excess or increases the production of, uh, of natural gastric juices. So if you have a sensitive stomach and you don't have other food components there, uh, like taking it after a meal, it may irritate. Now, as far as it working, it does work as a pain reliever, but it is not a, uh, a very strong uh, COX-2 inhibitor with the uh, uh, ibuprofen is very particular to COX-2 and doesn't really have an effect on COX-1, which is also very healing to the digestive tract. So uh, curcumin is more balanced than that. So I wouldn't say that the reason is because it parallels uh, ibuprofen. I would say the reason is because it's a spice and it's going to increase digestive juices. So you always want to take it with food. Yeah. And apparently um, she was taking it with the food. So um, um, okay. just not sure how, how that all hits. Um, and then we had um, somebody says her husband had a fatty liver, but since he's been on regular, regular taking the extra strength biocurcumin, his test, his tests no longer show a fatty liver. Uh, mm -hmm. So I thought that was that was an interesting comment from somebody. And yeah, no, that's that's great to know. I mean, curcumin has been studied by uh, by by a number of different brands, um, including the uh, previous. I think a formulation that you had for fatty liver, uh, turmeric mm -hmm. is actually one of the candidates that uh, has been getting a lot of uh, interest with fatty liver. So yeah, that's a great result. Well, great. Well, um, we sure appreciate your time this evening. We um, kept you a little bit longer than, than we had hoped, but um, we hope that everybody was able to stay with us. But thank you so much for joining us this evening. No problem. Thank you so much. All right, and thank you everyone for joining us, and uh, we'll be back next month with another great webinar. Until then, we pray that uh, you stay healthy. God bless. Yeah, God bless.